All right. Well, I show it being about uh, two after the hour. So uh, we'll go ahead and get started. I uh, appreciate everybody joining us this afternoon for our, uh, our third webinar uh, since uh, COVID-19 hit. And we're, today we're going to talk about reverse engineering and custom design, uh, in particular for instrumentation and control equipment. I'm joined today by Chris Harrington and John Sestra. You can see their videos, and we're going to have our uh, videos and mics live the whole time. Uh, so uh, we're gonna, we'll get started. Just a couple of quick housekeeping notes. So we found that uh, these webinars work best if we keep the audience on mute. But I do want to let you know that uh, you should see a Q&A button at the bottom of your uh, Zoom interface. And you can use that to ask questions uh, throughout the webinar. And, and that way you'll be able to you know, jot your questions down. We're going to answer them at the end. Uh, but don't be, you know, don't hesitate to ask the question when you think of it. We'll store all those in the queue as we go forward. If you're watching this on YouTube, uh, there's a chat feature there that you can use to, uh, to ask questions. And Matt Schustrick is going to copy those questions into our Q&A. So we'll capture that as well. And just as a reminder, uh, the webinar is being recorded. So we will send the link out to you and your colleagues after the webinar is complete. And that way you can forward it around or watch it again, you know, forward it to other people that might uh, get some benefit out of it. As far as the agenda, I'm going to cover a brief introduction to Paragon, and then we're going to get right into the meat of the presentation, which is what are the reasons uh, to consider reverse engineering? What are some examples of reverse engineering uh, from, you know, from that Paragon has successfully completed? We're going to talk a little bit about our custom design capabilities and then wrap up with a, with a Q&A. And we had a great uh, audience participation on the last webinar on Q&A, and I look forward to the same thing again uh, from this audience. So let me talk to you for just a minute on who Paragon is. Uh, we have the honor and distinction of being the largest non-OEM nuclear focused business in the United States. We have 185 employees at our three locations in Tennessee, New York, and in Texas. And Paragon was formed from ATC Nuclear. And we did that in 2017. And as part of uh, ATC Nuclear and its history, along with its history back to being uh, Spectrum Technologies, you know, the folks in, with, within Paragon have been focused on reverse engineering for 24 years. So we have a lot of experience and we're going to see how that experience helps us throughout this presentation today. We acquired as, uh, as uh, in February of 2020 uh, NLI, they became part of Paragon. And we're going to include some of those examples from nuclear logistics as well. They have a great history of reverse engineering that they've brought uh, to the team as we go forward. Uh, and always important for a nuclear audience uh, to know about our QA program. And our QA program has been audited by NUPIC, by NIAC. Uh, we've had audits by the Department of Energy and the Department of Defense, along with uh, numerous international customers that have come and, and witnessed all of our QA program programs. So today we're going to talk a little bit about custom design and spend a lot of time on reverse engineering. But you can see here that we have a, a number of other uh, ways that we provide, you know, solutions to our customers. And you can find more information about that on our website or through our PEAKS program. So you may wonder what PEAKS is. Uh, PEAKS is an application that we run on, a, on our website. Uh, it's an online catalog, a parts portal that lets you see all the various solutions that uh, Paragon has to offer for nuclear power plant parts. All of the solutions you're gonna to see today that we've reverse engineered are available on Peaks, along with the 9 million other solutions that we offer across our platform for alternate sourcing, uh, for you know, commercial grade dedication, for instrumentation control equipment repair. You can go in, you can search by, you know, via a part number, a manufacturer description, uh, even uh, a manufacturer itself, and see all of those different um, capabilities. If you don't find what you're looking for there, you can just request a, a quote for something that uh, is not in the catalog and our team will get right on top of it and we'll help for, uh, you know, find and, and figure out a solution for you. So I just want to let you know that our, our INC capabilities are primarily located in our Schenectady, New York and our Fort Worth, Texas locations. Combined those, uh, those two locations have about 40 engineers and technicians focused um, very closely on instrumentation and control equipment. And so we have a lot of people working in this. We're the largest, you know, third-party repair and reverse engineering 
uh, facility in the nuclear industry. And we're very proud of the work that, that our, our technicians have been and engineers are doing. We also provide 24 seven support to nuclear power plant customers around the world. We understand what it means to, uh, to be in a crisis situation at a power plant, to, to have an instance where you know, something's not going the, the way that you thought it would, and maybe in an outage, you've got a part that breaks and you need something in 24, 48 hours. You know, you get on the phone with us, we'll mobilize our, uh, our engineers and techs, and we'll start working on it right away. So uh, that's an important service that we provide the industry. So let me talk about some of the reasons to consider reverse engineering. And this is a topic that we're passionate about here at Paragon because we have seen real cost savings that have helped our customers, you know, deliver the nuclear promise, which is what we're all about here. So the first thing I want you to think about when you're considering reverse engineering is that it provides a great bridging strategy until planned upgrades are in place or funded. In fact, it even provides a bridging strategy to get you to uh, end of life so that you may never have to replace that system. We all know that upgrading systems are costly and that, you know, there's reduced capital budgets at all the power plants these days. Reverse engineering can really help offset those costs and let you use that money for another system or, or component that's, you know, not suitable for reverse engineering. Uh, reverse engineering can also address problems at the part level. So let's say that you have a, a large, uh, you know, instrumentation control system and only the power supplies are obsolete. Well, we can come in, reverse engineer those power supplies and allow that system to continue to operate versus uh, you know, replacing it just because you've got a few obsolete components. I'd also uh, like to point out that cybersecurity challenges are, are real and they have been a, you know, a challenge to overcome when installing digital equipment at plants and reverse engineered analog solutions you know, don't, don't carry those same issues. Um, there are no new evaluations required when you replace analog for analog. So you don't have the, the cost or expense of another, um, of an additional cybersecurity evaluation. You also don't introduce any new uh, risks to the plant because of a new uh, digital device or new vulnerability. And that's, a, that's an important way to keep everybody moving forward in this new environment that we're dealing with. Uh, the plants understand how to maintain reverse engineered equipment. So it's very similar to the equipment that's already installed. So you're gonna have common maintenance practices, common procedures. Most of your uh, documents will, will be the same. Your human machine interface stays the same. And so um, it's important to, to remember that some of those hidden costs of a, of a change out are borne on, uh, on the maintenance departments. And in the case of reverse engineering, all of your, uh, your previous work is really gonna be valid for, for the plant going forward, the system going forward. Also, um, one of the issues with uh, new digital systems is that their obsolescence curves are very steep. Uh, typically, a digital INC product will go obsolete in 10 to 12 years. You know, we're reverse engineering analog systems that date back to the 1950s in some cases, and we're still able to get most of the components that are a part of that board. Uh, and and you, you compare that to a digital system from the 1970s, 80s, 90s, or even the early 2000s, they're very difficult to find um, replacement parts. So again, you know, your analog systems really are supportable for the long term, and we don't see that changing, you know, as we go forward into the 2021 and beyond that. So I'd like to turn this over to uh, uh, Chris Harrington to get his uh, thoughts on how we define reverse engineering at Paragon. So Chris, thanks for joining me. Appreciate it. Thanks, Todd. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, so what is reverse engineering, right? So reverse engineering is, is the process of recreating the technical uh, design documentation required to remanufacture the product. So uh, with the end goal of creating an equivalent component that is form, fit, function, and qualificationally equivalent to the original item. So some of the documents we have to create along the way, you know, include schematics, bills of materials, whatever mechanical drawings we need, um, PCB uh, layout, uh, artwork for recreating the circuit board, as well as, you know, maybe some mechanical drawings and uh, other pieces that are required, you know, as well as procedures and any qualification documents and, and, and procedures as well. You know, the scope of today's discussion here is, is the INC reverse engineering of, which are mostly electronic components with some mechanical aspects as well. You know, they, they vary from full chassis to gearboxes, and we'll show a couple examples of those. But maybe a circuit board that's the size of a piece of paper or a host of circuit boards, um, you know, with 
30, 40, 50 uh, components on them. Yeah, so to, we're, we do some mechanical reverse engineering at, um, at Paragon, but that's not the scope of today's discussion. We're, we'll cover that okay. in another uh, webinar in the future. So, so Chris, know, talk, uh, talk a little bit about the two approaches that we're using for reverse engineering typically. Yeah, so what we try to do is the, the goal of, you know, make it easiest for, for the plant to accept a piece of equipment would be to provide them something that's identical to the original. So that's one of the things that we strive for is, you know, we try to make an exact replica. We try to almost remanufacture the original. So when you put them side by side, there's very, very little differences. Um, it's visible to the human eye, right? So we go down to the point so much as we'll take a circuit board and measure the location of every single component. And when we create our new circuit board, we'll place component, the same components or equivalent components in the same exact location as the original to recreate it. And there's a good example there on the bottom. And when we do an exact replication like this, it also affords us the ability to create a, an item equivalency evaluation that goes down to the depth of component by component. So like R1 uh, and its attributes and the original are this and R1 and the new unit and its attributes are, are, are that. And any differences are described and discussed as to what, what impact they could have. Um, as well as the item equivalency evaluation, also talking about the overall assemblies uh, equivalence from, from a, a FEMA or failure modes and effects analysis, as well as physical and electrical interfaces. Any, any difference does, that, that, are, that are there. The other approach is a, a black box approach um, where we, def we have the definition of the inputs and the outputs and we recreate the internals to, to perform that particular function. So on this side, there's a, there's an example of a power supply. The original one's on top, and you can see that over the years, it's it, the, the color of it's like ambered, and that's the conformal coating on it that it's turned color um, due to only, not only age, but also heating. And this particular power supply has 30 some electrolytic capacitors that we are swapping out frequently. And you know, after this thing's been through a couple heat cycles, trying to replace those components and those, those electrolytic capacitors really degrade the, the the reliability of the, the circuit board after you try to do that a few times. So when we were given the challenge of trying to reverse engineer something like that, we, we took a different approach. We took, we, we applied that black box approach and we, we built a power supply that, you know, you know, didn't, didn't have all those same electrolytic capacitors. It just had one and you can see it in the bottom corner there where it's one, one screw terminal capacitor that becomes really easy for, for maintaining its shelf life and usable life, you know, just by changing that one cap. So really, really, you know, address the concerns of the, and the problem that we saw with that, with that original unit. We weren't going down the path of trying to replicate something that we saw, we saw an issue with. So that was a perfect application for a, for a black box. Yeah, and I like how it also highlights how, you know, we're thinking about the future maintainability of these systems when we're going through reverse engineering and, and you and the, the team in New York, with, you know, through all those years of experience, you know, have learned to make it easy on yourself the next time when you need to replace that capacitor, right? Absolutely. So what, let's talk, give us a, a highlight on some of the good candidates for reverse engineering. It's a question we get a lot from our customers, you know, is this something that you guys could reverse engineer? So talk a little bit about, you know, what makes a good candidate for reverse engineering? Yeah, so when we're talking about INC items, there's really nothing that we can't reverse engineer. We just have to make sure we have a good uh, you know, some of it's, some of it comes down to an economic decision. You know, there's a list of items here and we'll have some examples of those um, as we go throughout the presentation. But, you know, there is some NRE charge that's required to develop all that tech or recreate all that technical information. So if there's a situation where there's maybe a few, a few installations of that particular component around the plant, or there's an opportunity to have the same component at other fleets or, you know, within a fleet of, of plants. So, you know, that helps with the, the, the economics of scale there. That's certainly one attribute. Or there might be in a situation where the upgrade costs are just too cumber or too difficult to overcome. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it's just one particular card out of a system is obsolete. And that, 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 that lends itself to a good, a good candidate as well. Um, there's really, like I said, there's really nothing that we can't reverse engineer, you know, even, even digital items, we've overcome those challenges. And we've had, we have an example to show later on. Yeah, I often encourage people to, 
to think about reverse engineering, particularly for systems where, you know, replacement, you know, the, the current system is working well and, you know, you don't need to replace it with a better system. And so that's something else to think about is just, is your system working well? Have you had problems with it? If not, then why not uh, reverse engineer it and, and, and keep the same, uh, same maintainable system, you know, for the life of the plant? Yeah, we'll say two times that, you know, a lot of times when somebody's asking, hey, can Paragon reverse engineer this? We just ask for a picture. Hey, send us a picture, or if we can Google search that number, we can find a picture. We can usually right away give a thumbs up or thumbs down if it's, it's going to be a, a good candidate. All right. Well, with that, let's walk through some, uh, some case studies. And I'm going to get started with one um, that is, has been a great uh, example for us. And John Sester is going to provide some highlights. But I do want to just recognize that uh, we received a, a, a technology award, a supplier of the year award from Utility Service Alliance for this very solution just this year. And we appreciate that recognition. You know, thanks for that, uh, Utility Service Alliance. And we we're able to save uh, you know, plants about $5 million per reactor. But there's quite a bit of a story here. So John, give us a little highlight. Uh, thanks, Ty. Uh, so the picture in the upper right is a EGM box. Um, we've repaired that box for many years, and we were asked by some of our customers if we could reverse engineer it. So we took on the project. Um, the box has three plug-in circuit boards and associated wiring underneath. Um, along with the EGM box, there's a RGSC that's associated with it. So we also reverse engineered that. And uh, yeah, we had some challenges. We created mechanical drawings, uh, circuit board, uh, artwork, everything we needed to reverse engineer the items. Um, we, uh, since then, uh, probably about 10 years ago or so, uh, we have many of these units located in sites all over the world, not just in the US. And it, it sparked some interest uh, from uh, GE Hitachi and the Boiling Water um, Reactor Owners Group. So uh, in conjunction, they decided to evaluate our uh, reverse engineered unit. And uh, the unit went to GEH, they did a full evaluation. Uh, GEH came to our facility and uh, one of the sites shipped us a turbine simulator. So we were able to attach the EGM box and the RGSC to the turbine simulator, ran through a full gamut of tests, and um, it was very successful. And GE is now endorsing our product to be used in the nuclear industry. Yeah, it's um, been, a, been a great success. Um, so. We'll, we're going to continue with uh, another uh, project example that John's been very close to for a long time. It's a traversing in-core probe uh, system drawer. This is a drawer that controls the movement of a, you know, it's a little fission chamber that's on a cable and the system, you know, it, uh, they have a little gearbox that pushes the cable up through the reactor and that fission chamber helps them calibrate the internal fission chambers, the LPRMs that are inside of a boiling water reactor. And in this case, John, you worked uh, pretty closely with some sites for replacement. Uh, yes, uh, that's correct, Ty. Um, so this was a pretty extensive project, uh, a lot of circuit boards involved, uh, mechanical drawings. Um, so uh, the unit was obsoleted. Uh, we spoke to uh, various site system engineers and maintenance people and we learned of the downfalls of the original design. So in the reverse engineered design, we addressed those issues. Uh, one was a solenoid operated switch with uh, 12 decks and 10 positions, uh, very unreliable. Uh, we ended up replacing that switch with uh, optical switch. So the new design has no moving parts, no maintenance. Um, another issue was the availability of test points and being able to troubleshoot the drawer. So we designed in uh, test aids into the circuit boards to make it easier to test. Uh, the original documentation still applies. It operates in the same manner and function. The HMI controls on the front panel, all this, the, the knobs identical. 
Um, what we found through site walk downs is that uh, each site had a slightly different color front panel. So we matched, color matched the, uh, the front panel to the control room scheme at each site. Um, so this too, we had at a uh, trade show, uh, GEH was there, they saw our design, uh, they wanted to evaluate it, evaluate it. We sent them a unit for full evaluation and um, they also endorsed this product and uh, is available through GEH. That was a great uh, endorsement. Uh, you know, another engine. thing, uh, we had an issue with testing this unit because it has five big Amphenol connectors for mm -hmm. input and outputs. So we had to design a simulator, a plant simulator, just to test this. And once some of the site engineers saw that sim simulator, uh, they decided to purchase simulators along with the drawers. I think that brings up a, a really good question, which is, you know, how is it that, you know, reverse engineering something's one thing, but in order to supply it to a nuclear power plant, we've got to, you know, be able to test it. So, Chris, uh, what are some of the things we're doing to make sure we can test all these complex devices? Yeah, so Paragon's methodology or ideology and when it comes to testing is we test every single input and output, you know. So you can imagine on some of these cards, you know, some of them have hundreds of IO pins. So we have to come up with some test fixtures, uh, some customized fixtures. And there's a few examples here, you know, that maybe what they're driving or what they need is a little calibration pod or some, some switches or some LEDs or they're driving a display or, you know, there's a lot of things that we understand that these are driving and they need inputs from. So we, we have to come up with some pretty elaborate test fixtures at times. Um, and so when it comes to testing the, the inputs or the outputs, um, we have two, two methods of thoughts, right? One is if we know what, this, what it connects to in the system, mm -hmm. we'll try to simulate that with a, you know equivalent load or whatever that, that circuit that's attached to it, we'll try to replicate that as part of our test fixture and our burn-in fixture. Um, if, if that information is not available or it's something complex that we just can't, it doesn't make sense to replicate, what we'll do is we'll, we'll look at how that circuit is designed and put a load on it that's maybe approaching the limits of components, right? So if it's, you know, the output is able to drive one amp, maybe we'll drive like up to 0.8 amps, but in installation, it might be like 0.01 amps, right? So we make sure we stress it to, to nearly, nearly the maximum ratings of the components to make sure that there's never gonna be an issue when it goes to be installed. Um, and then, you know, like I said, some of them, I, some of the, the boards are so complex that they have, you know, you can't just hook up a bunch of jumpers and test an item. Um, so you have to come up with some, some creative solutions. So in the bottom right hand corner, there's, there's a, a picture of one of the fixtures that one of our, our newer engineers had put together and, you know, using some off the shelf Arduinos to interface to 150 digital IO pins and a serial bus, you know, I thought that would be a pretty innovative solution for them to come up with a solution like that to that complexity um, using some some pretty low cost solution there that helps overall you know keep the costs of the project down by not having to spend a ton of time in developing you know some really hardcore specific uh, um, hardware we can use some off of the shelf stuff. Yeah, I really like this example. These Arduino, um, you know, you know the, the the Arduino devices because they're you know ubiquitous now, but you know five years ago they they didn't really exist and uh, you know engineers that are coming out of college today or familiar with them, they understand how to program them, and then we can use them as part of our, uh, our test fixturing. So we're, we're learning something new all the time, certainly not uh, something available when Chris and I were in college, but uh, today it's a lot easier. You don't have to have a, you know, a $25,000 National Instruments device to set up a good uh, test fixture for a lot of these parts. Absolutely. So uh, another example, a good case study for us is a, a large production run. So this was a project that uh, took a year, but it had a lot of, uh, a lot of parts and pieces. And it's to support a, the average power range monitoring, rod block monitoring, and local power range monitoring system, which is a, a mouthful. But it, you know, it basically, uh, in a boiling water reactor, it kind of you know, operates the, uh, the fission chambers that are inside the core, and then just checks to make sure that everything's okay, and it puts some interrupts in if things are not the way that they should be. 
Um, so Chris Arrington, walk us through uh, this project and, and what we learned from it. Yeah, so we were approached by uh, one of our customers a couple of years ago to, to tackle this, um, you know, power monitoring system. And this is, was uh, a great opportunity to provide a solution for the whole system. So there was a 15 car, 15 unique cards with many quantities that we've uh, we've repaired over the past and we've supplied out of our NIMS group and, and, and out of our warehousing departments. Um, and we supported for a while. And, you know, that at one point they wanted to pursue a really a re overhaul of the whole system. So we actually got a, it was an opportunity for us to understand how it installs. And, and you know, usually we just get like the one circuit board and we're, we're reverse engineering that one without understanding the, the system level things. Um, or have an opportunity to have some system level hardware. In this case, the plant was able to provide us a whole, a whole drawer or a whole rack that all the specimens were in. So we, you know, we used those specimens to do the reverse engineering of each individual card. And then we could, you know, part of our, our reverse engineering process, we're trying to make sure that if any components are different height or uh, different shape or anything, that they're not gonna interfere with the other parts in the system. So this gives a great opportunity to take our cards and put them into the chassis to make sure that there were no interference problems and be able to understand what the what the floating connectors on the back plane might look like and you know some of the challenges and, and, and maintenance associated with the back plane as well you know as we were developing our, our, our card strategy here you know in the first production run of these that we did and the whole scope was in in the, in the order of about a year from order entry to delivery of about 1200 cards so it was a, it was a very aggressive schedule and we you know we were able to overcome uh, all the challenges associated with a reverse engineering 15 unique part numbers. Um, and since that project, you know, we've supplied about a little over a thousand uh, subsequent pieces of that system, you know, as, as the plant wants to supply their stock with additional units. Um, you know, some of the challenges with this, you know, the picture on the bottom left, it has a rotary switch that we, uh, when we repaired these in the past, the plant said, hey, make sure you look at this rotary switch. We've had problems with it before. So we were able to find and source the, the, the original switch there and came up with the mechanical uh, drawing and part for the, the little faceplate there. And, you know, the one on the bottom right has some, some relays that we had to uh, work with a relay manufacturer to remake to the original specifications. So yeah, it was a great opportunity for us to kind of understand and see a whole system and how it all works together and provide a, a whole system solution for, for our customer. Yeah, it was certainly been a successful project and, and one that, uh, you know, we're proud to talk about because we did supply a lot of parts in a short time frame. 1,200 cards is a, a full production run. We normally would be making, you know, one or two of each card for most of our projects. So it kind of stretches in some new ways, but, uh, the team did a great job, you know, supporting and, and shipping it out on time. So you talked a little bit, Chris, about, you know, our history and we repair cards and then we get into reverse engineering. And I think this is another example of these control, um, turbine control cards that we repaired them for a number of years for the customer. And then ultimately they got to a point where we had to reverse engineer them. Yeah, right. So yeah, this is an uh, English electric uh, turbine control system where the plant was having some, some problems and it, I don't recall exactly if it was an LCO or is preventing it from, from restarting or what was going on with the situation, but they were in urgent need of uh, getting cards back operational. So they sent us a whole system uh, of cards and we, you know, the team rallied around it. We repaired all the cards that they had and we got them their system back up and running, you know, in an expedited fashion. Uh, and then after that, they followed up and said, hey, you know, since we had a problem with this, we don't want to run into that again. You know, they lose a lot of money anytime they're down. So well, we reverse engineered these cards and some of the unique characteristics of these cards were that there's this little op amp module and there's about a total of eight unique cards, I believe, with this system. So there's this little op amp module that was on, each, you know, on several of those cards. So we, we reverse engineered and made a module that was very similar to the original. So we, we didn't incorporate it into the design of the board. We kept the board designed the same way the original manufacturer had made it. So much so that the, the OEM made some of these cards a little universal where uh, you could put a card in different slots, but you would have to change maybe some jumpers or add some parts or shake out some parts. So you could see right above the bottom amplifier there, there's a couple silkscreen parts that are missing uh, or missing silkscreen um, because those were the, the 
the universal aspects of this particular card. So we, we reverse engineered it exactly the way the original was to allow that flexibility for the customer to, to if they have that situation where they have to swap, swap locations of that card, they had, had the ability to put those parts in and make those changes as necessary. Um, the one on the bottom left, you know, shows a picture, it's a pretty simple board overall. The, the only complexity with that would be being the, the relays. Those are six, six black boxes there are relays. And we, those, those have been long obsolete, and, but we were able to work with a relay manufacturer that you know, we've built a rapport with and we've used them on many projects at this point, where they were able to make those, those relays to the original specifications. Um, so much so that those relays drop into the original board. So if we have a repair situation of the original boards, we can use those relays to fix those. Uh, and then we incorporated that design in our, in our, our replacement solution as well. And, you know, for, for the most part, the INC stuff that we see or work on, you know, a lot of it, you know, is, is small resistors, capacitors, you know, ICs and stuff like that are, are typically um, seismically insensitive. But there are situations where, you know, this example with relays and the one previous with switches or rotary switches or toggle switches, that have an electromechanical aspect that is seismically sensitive. So we'll go through the whole rigor of, you know, doing the seismic qualification and, and maintaining qualification attributes. And, and as we build the lots and make sure that they're all qualified as well and provide all the qualification testing as necessary. Yeah, you know, I think you highlight a really good point with these relays that we had custom made. And that is that, you know, we have those relationships uh, through all of our experience you know, of, of fine, knowing the suppliers that can still do the custom magnetics, they can do the relays, they can help us do um, the switches or, you know, the parts that are hard to get, the, the gauges. So we have developed over the years this, you know, whole supply chain that can support us still on, you know, parts that you cannot find uh, in inventory anywhere else. Yeah, but, uh, certainly. It, yeah, it really helps the relationships there. Yeah, absolutely. Well, John, um, I'd like you to kind of talk a little bit about this project because it it highlights some of the you know improvements that we make uh, to boards that you know for usability and it also uh, demonstrates some of our important lessons learned over the years. Uh, yes, so uh, these are EHC boards that are common in the industry. Uh, one of our customers in Canada uh, had a request uh, to um, have spares. And they sent us a schematic and pictures of what they needed. And when we looked closely at the schematic and the board, we saw some differences. So that prompted us to go up uh, to visit the customer. And we took the schematic and followed every single connection on the schematic, compared it to the board, found the discrepancies. Uh, when we got back to the office, we uh, created the artwork to match the board they had installed. Not necessarily the documentation because we find it more often than not that the documentation doesn't 100% match the um, actual installed unit. So uh, in doing so, um, the upper picture uh, shows some uh, potentiometers, four potentiometers. On the original card, these are are, were mounted on some tall plastic standoffs, which made them a little unstable to adjust. And uh, the card also had some custom test points uh, that was gonna be expensive for us to replicate. So we came up with this unique design to create a little daughter board that had standard components <coughs> mounted to it. And we attached that to the, the main board. And that provided us all the, the height uh, necessary to adjust the potentiometers, access the test points. And uh, once we had that design, we approached the customer with it and uh, they approved it and we went ahead and manufactured uh, the cards. Um, the uh, lower picture shows a couple black boxes. Those are custom transformers. Um, we were able to work with a transformer vendor and that vendor replicated the transformers for us and we were able to populate them in the card and supply the card the same form fit function as the original yeah i think it's a really good example of uh you know how we we do some interesting things i i, I like that we've created this you know daughter board here 
and you know that thing has got to be a thousand times more rigid than having these pots on, you know, a, a standoff that you can wobble and move around. So and the thing was not well designed or well thought out to start with. And those improvements will, you know, these cars will last longer than the ones that they replaced, you know, which had already lasted for over 40 years. Right. So it's a really good example and, and good work from the team. Here's another example of, uh, of our reverse engineering that it, in my mind, it really shows how we're able to do digital system reverse engineering. And John, you were involved with this one from the start. So kind of walk through the, the process that we followed for this and, and some of the unique uh, things that we had to do to support it. Um, yes, yeah, so this is a, a digital card, uh, part of a ICCMS system. Um, I, one of our international customers in Spain asked us to reverse engineer the system cards, probably about eight different cards. And this, this particular one posed some challenges because it's actually four layers. Uh, the two inner layers are power and ground planes. And luckily the traces are on the top and bottom side. So we were able to compare the uh, original board layout to the schematic. And again, we found some discrepancies uh, that we um, took care of in our uh, PCB, PCB layout. Um, so uh, there is one programmable device on this card. Uh, we brought a device reader writer on site and under the customer's supervision and using our cybersecurity program, we were able to extract the firmware from the chip and program new chips right in front of the customer which we then brought back and we installed them in new boards once they were ready to be populated. Um, so the, the customer was extremely happy that we were able to support this system uh, and that avoided uh, a costly system upgrade. That's a, a good example of something on the more complex side that we've done. And, and this next example is also a, a good example of complexity but it kind of you know, goes in, the, in a different direction. So this one is uh, a fixed set point module. It's used to control a, uh, a governor system or, or use a turbine system. And it involves both uh, electronic reverse engineering and mechanical reverse engineering in a very unique control system configuration that you know, probably dates from the 1950s. So Chris Harrington, won't you uh, walk us through some of the, the kind of the unique uh, things about this, um, this module? Yes. So it's, it's always great to be able to see how engineers always over, used to overcome a lot of these challenges to create these control systems, right? So this one, it has a, a stepper motor and a potentiometer. It's, it's, a, it's a motor driven, uh, motor operated potentiometer at the end of the day. But mm -hmm. It takes in an electrical signal to move a pot to then, then create a, a feedback electrical system signal, which is interesting that they use mechanical in between it. So it's just, it shows you the evolution of electronics over the years, like you're saying, Ty. Um, so what was really, really interesting about this one, you know, outside of the five or six circuit boards that are, that are part of this system, but there was a, a large mechanical component of this, that's this whole gearbox. There's a total of eight gears and two clutches. And like I said, a motor, op, a potentiometer that was very precise and a, and a stepper motor. So it gave us the opportunity to, you know, create some really precision drawings to, so we had uh, press fit bearings and had, you know, exact shaft alignment. So there was no binding in that gearbox. And uh, we even so much as created a, a torque guide to, to set the the, the torque required on the two clutches that are inside the gearbox. So it was a lot of stuff that we really got to learn and we had some really great um, help from some of our technicians that are just really great hands-on guys and you know they really take uh, a pride in their work and their craftsmanship and, and really stepped up to the plate and helped us with this this particular project. Um, another you know kind of unique thing about this is the circuit board on the bottom picture there all the way to the bottom it's it's like on hinges. And so when we reverse engineered this, we replicated that whole hinge assembly. And it, that's so that they could, uh, the two boards are in close proximity there so that they could hinge the one way out of the way of the other and you know perform maintenance or calibration or whatever they needed to get access to that board for. So that was another unique little feature that we incorporated and in, in, you know, it was the first time we've seen something like that on one of these. Um, one of the things that we did, you know, we talked about 
you know, not only reverse engineering, but also doing some value add. And so we, we look to provide some opportunity and, and get some feedback from the plant and, and the, the maintenance engineers and, and the system techs and stuff to, to understand what some of their challenges are. Um, you know, maybe it's just adding a test point so they don't have to unrack the whole thing to be able to, to calibrate it or, you know, uh, 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 an extra test jack here or there or some way to clip on a clip, you know, a lead. You know, we always look for ways to do that as well as, you know, fix any any known issues like a, a board is overheated in a spot. We'll add some copper and change the components maybe to, to increase the reliability of that. But in this, in this case here, um, all the boards were wired together with um, like so soldered in wires, which made it really difficult for one for us to assemble and test and troubleshoot. So uh, we used some really high reliability connectors and, and, and made that interface a lot easier. So, you know, for the future, it makes it a lot easier to work on. So we're always looking for opportunities to make, make some small improvements that don't necessarily impact the overall form fit and function. And, and along the way, we're in, you know, complete uh, conversation with the customer to make sure that it's going to meet all their needs. Yeah, great example. So I want to talk just for a moment about uh, Lambda power supplies. So they're you know, ubiquitous in the U.S. nuclear industry. Uh, we've we've been able to engineer or reverse engineer over 100 different uh, Lambda power supply designs. You can go in and see those uh, part numbers and peaks. Uh, so the Paragon ES.com and then go and search in our catalog. You can find them there. But if you'd like us to go ahead and, and do that service for you, you can get in contact with us. Um, you know, Matt Schuster's contact information and mine and Chris Harrington's are all part of this um, um, webinar. And we'll take a look at uh, the part numbers that you've got for Lambda Power Supplies, match them up to the ones that are available, um, you know, from us. And we may find that there are some of them that are more like you know, cousins instead of exact replicas. And um, there are not that many differences between them. And so we'll take a look at that. Sometimes you can really cut down the expense of reverse engineering if you've got a component that's close to start with. Uh, so we'll, we're happy to look at that for you. Like I said, we've got about 100 different designs that are already reverse engineered. So a, a good opportunity for cost savings there. One of the things I wanted to talk about uh, quickly before we discuss some of our custom designs is how we address uh, part level obsolescence. And uh, Chris Harrington, can you walk us through these two examples on you know, how we were able to address part level obsolescence in what I think are some pretty unique ways? Yeah, so you know, as, as just John had mentioned with the Woodward stuff, we, you know, we repaired those for a bunch of years before we were given the opportunity to, to provide a reverse engineering solution. So on this set of cards here, um, this was another EHC type system where the, uh, the, the components circled in, in red here uh, there's a little DC to DC converter and the, the plant was coming out of their, their uh, refueling outage. And, you know, so this whole system was causing problems. So they sent us all the cards and we scrounged through all the cards that they had in inventory and they had installed. And we were able to sort through all those parts and make this particular card that was a problem functional by, by swapping out those, those little DC to DC converters and got them, you know, out of their, out of their, um, their refueling outage and able to come back up on full power, uh, you know, in an expeditious manner. Um, and then for, for maintaining the, the other cards that were, um, that this, this, this converter was just not up to par, we reverse engineered the little module as shown on the right there. So there's a little plug-in, you know, it, it, you're able to unsolder the, the original one and plug this one in. And we came up with that solution and had that, you know, a couple prototypes in about seven days. And then another seven days after that, for a total lead time of about 14 days, we were able to, to, to build about 50 of those cards and, you know, replenish their stock. So, you know, they were up and running with the bare minimum they needed. needed. And then we supplied another 50 cards for them to have an inventory so they don't, they don't have to run into that situation in the future. So, it's, you know, it's an opportunity for us to provide just that one piece. There was nothing wrong with the rest of the card. You know, there's no sense in and spending the, the time and effort and cost of reverse engineering the whole card and the plastic and the fingers and all this stuff. And just that one part that was the problem, we, we were able to, you know, basically maintain their equipment. The one on the bottom here, it's a, you know, a regular switching power supply and the part circled in, the, the capacitor circled in red there was, was a problem. Um, so part of our repair and refurbishment process is we're, we're changing out those age sensitive components and in this case, this capacitor was a 
uh, is a four-legged component. You know, the, the two capacitor terminals for electrical connection and had two extra, extra pins that were used for mechanical stability. And because of the way those, those four pins were used, we couldn't get a, a replacement capacitor that met all the electrical parameters that was you know, readily available that would fit that. You know, I can see that's pretty jammed into that little spot there and it also has a height constraint. So you know, we couldn't find something off the shelf to, to fit in that location. So what we, the team what did is they, they came up with a little circuit board that interfaced to those four pins and we mounted four readily available capacitors that in parallel gave the same capacitance and had the same voltage rating. And, you know, like I said, we're trying to maintain the form, fit, and function. And in this case, the form of that particular component was, was you know, significantly different than the original. It wasn't a one-for-one. One. So we went through the whole seismic uh, evaluation and shape of that little package there to make sure that when we installed it in the host component, there would be no impacts to its seismic qualification. So that's you know, another opportunity where we could save the whole piece of equipment by just repair or replacing that one piece with a unique solution there. That's a good example. And, and again, we have to always think about, you know, since we're going into the nuclear power plants, you know, what's the, what is the qualification impact of some of these change outs? And that's something that, uh, you know, we, our team's always conscious of that, that we're going through for each and every, every component that we replace, whether that's repair or reverse engineering. So let's take a, a couple of minutes to walk through some of the you know, two of the custom design solutions that, that we're, we're going to highlight today. Um, we don't do a ton of custom design, but I did want to make sure that uh, folks were aware of our capabilities as it comes to that. And the first, uh, the first system we're going to look at is an isolation system for a plant computer. In this case, um, we, we actually won an award from the utility, uh, an innovation award to be able to supply this because it saved them so much money and so much hassle in, in changing out to a different technology. So uh, Chris Harrington, walk us through you know, what went into this and, and what its functions were. So yeah, this is a, you know, uh, analog, uh, it's at 104 channels of analog uh, isolation um, to isolate between some field contacts and a plant computer, as well as about 200 uh, dry contacts, you know, open switch type contacts. Um, and, you know, you think about it, there's plenty of commercially available analog and, and contact type isolation systems, but made, made this unique, there's, there was two aspects to it. One is there was some, some physical constraints, you know, it had to interface to the existing uh, field wiring, you know, we'd want to take on the expense of trying to replace all that or redo that. And there were some physical attributes of having the cards in a, a specific volume when the system was all put together was another another piece to it. But um, a lot of the commercial cards, when you look at them, a lot of them have uh, the analog input, but then they have like some kind of digital output. In this case, they want, we wanted a fully analog system. So fully analog on the input to the fully analog, you know, non one E side outputs. Um, so what made this unique is those two things, right? We would have certainly done a, used a commercial off the shelf parts if they fit both the physical um, location that all this had to be jammed into, as well as the, some of the technical parameters. It had a really high uh, uh, linearity requirement as well as a really low temperature drift. So, you know, we, we try to look at it as a, you know, providing the, the best value to the customer as well. Right. So, like I said, if there was a commercially available solution or something we could have packaged easily and readily, that would have been our approach. In this case, it wasn't, you know, we couldn't, we couldn't check off all those boxes for all those requirements. And uh, so we came up with this, this particular custom solution that, you know, met all those physical and, and interface requirements. Um, you know, we were able to do, this was all EMI and RFI qualified as well as, you know, seismic and all the other qualification requirements. And like I said, it's a, a fully analog system. So it was, it was a, Pretty, pretty neat project. Yeah, and you, and you bring up a really good point, which is that, you know, we're going to try to push our, our customers towards the, the best solution for their particular scenario and, and make sure that we take cost into that context. You know, we, we recognize that reverse engineering is not going to be the solution every time. And we have a, you know, a myriad of ways uh, through, you know, dedication and, and equipment qualification to provide alternative solutions. Uh, but you know, for a lot of things, we can come in and, and do, when it makes sense, do the custom solutions, do the reverse engineering solutions. Otherwise, we're going to talk about, you know, you know, dedication of, uh, of equipment to, to utilizing these situations. 
So I don't want people to think that, uh, you know, reverse engineering is a hammer and everything we look at, you know, a nail and we got to reverse engineer it. We look at the whole system and look at the, all the solutions that are available. And if we know of something that will be better for you in the long term, you know, that's, that's the way that we, we move forward. So it's, uh, you know, we work with our customers every day on, you know, making those kind of choices. Yeah, absolutely, Ty. You know, we, you know, having all those those arms under our under our umbrella of capabilities, right? They really give us the flexibility to, you know, see what's commercially available. Mm -hmm. uh, we even when we get a, an opportunity to do reverse engineering, or somebody contacts us, uh, you know, we look to see if the OEM still supports the product or is willing to make it. And there's times that we've we've called them, and you know, they're still in business, you know, which is kind of rare at times, but. They said, yeah, well, you know, we haven't made that part in 30, 40 years, but we still have all the, the documentation and we can still rebuild it for you. So, you know, we, we certainly look at all the options. Yeah, we do. And I think uh, I like this, uh, this last uh, example of uh, custom designs because it's, you know, 180 degrees away from uh, some of the examples that we've shown today that were probably originally designed in the 1950s. And in this case, this is a custom solution that includes, you know, recent, very recent technologies for Bluetooth, you know, cellular LTE networks and wireless technologies. And it just shows the, the spectrum of the capabilities we have here at Paragon. Yeah, so this is a, a case where a customer had a concept that they wanted to build this particular light pack and, and you know, they wanted to have all these bells and whistles, but they didn't have the, uh, the ability to design the hardware associated with it. So that's where we work closely with them. And, you know, well, it's a light pack, right? At the end of the day, it's its core function is the power goes out, the lights come on, right? They're, you see them everywhere and all sorts of, you know, not just plants, but also industrial applications, um, have them all over my office. Um, but what's really unique or what, what the challenge that the, the customer was trying to overcome is, you know, with the, these batteries inside these packs, um, they require a lot of maintenance. So there's a lot of man hours going into maintaining the system. So one of the things that they wanted to do was you know, a way to make it smart to be able to monitor its own health and then report out when it doesn't meet those checks to, to eliminate a lot of that, you know, walk on and maintenance piece. Um, so we worked with, with the customer on this and the design, you know, the hardware that does the analog function as well as, like you're saying, communicate through Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, LTE to, to then provide a host of information to a single point that you know can send out an email when the battery health test failed or you know this, this particular zone lost power and this lights on or you know there's something going on over there so it really brought the two pieces together right the analog hardware that provides the core function and the, 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 the you know the safety piece of what that thing has to do and then we isolated the the um, the commercial aspect of trying to report it out and just provide some intelligence to, to a bigger system. So it was a really good marrying of the two technologies. And that's, you know, our, our, our knowledge base is heavily on the analog side. So that's where, you know, coming up with a solution like that is really, really in our, our wheelhouse. Yeah, it's been, it was a great project and uh, we all learned a lot, you know, working through that. Absolutely. Well, those are the, that, that kind of concludes the technical content of the presentation. We're getting ready to move into uh, the Q&A session, but I just want to leave you with uh, four takeaways uh, before we do uh, some Q&A. So the first thing I want you to remember uh, as you leave the webinar today is that, you know, we've shown you a, a variety of complexities across all of these case studies, and we can do things at Paragon from a capacitor change out, like Chris talked about, all the way to uh, full drawer and full system replacements in reverse engineering. So practically everything is, is reverse engineerable at a plant. So you know, come talk to us and, and we'll work through what we think is gonna be the best solution for you. Reverse engineering is a great bridging strategy until you're able to get plant funding uh, for your, your system upgrade. And in some cases, we can bridge you long enough to where you know, you're at plant end of life before you even need to think about a replacement. And that's important because there are other things at, uh, at power plants besides transportation and control equipment. And you can use that capital maybe that was, you know, set aside for a, a Woodward Governor system, you know, control system upgrade. You know, use that capital to do something else that needs to happen. And that just is part of the spirit of delivering the nuclear promise. Um, Paragon is capable of doing both custom analog and custom digital designs. So if you've got a project or something you've thought about and you don't have an off the shelf solution, 
but you think that it's going to be a, a benefit to your station, come talk to us. You know, we've got great capabilities in the design of the systems. We can qualify the sensors. We can help walk through the qualification requirements. In the case of the uh, example for remote monitoring, you know, we qualified that device to meet uh, UL requirements for, um, you know, fire protection systems, something that our team was not familiar with, but, you know, we educated ourselves on it and, and came up to speed fast. And then my final point is, you know, most INC equipment can be reverse engineered. And so it's really a trade off between the expense and the benefit to decide what you want to do with your equipment going forward. In some cases, you know, if your equipment is working very well and you don't have any changes needed to the design, you know, go ahead and reverse engineer it because it's gonna, gonna work well. You know, if you're a point where you can gain megawatts by replacing a control system with a modern, you know, digital system, well, you should do that and it's gonna pay a dividend back to you. So we'll, you know, we work through all those things with you. So with that, um, we're gonna move into a Q and A section. I'm gonna leave this slide up for just a, a couple of minutes and uh, you can see I've got my contact information here. Chris Harrington's contact information is here. You can go to our website and contact us. And I promise that somebody from Paragon answers the phone when you call and, and we're available 24 seven and take that responsibility really seriously. We got people on that are on call all the time and uh, they don't hesitate to contact us, do they, Chris Harrington, when they need to. You know, they, they're always, uh, Ready for the always willing. So um, with that, I'm gonna just stop sharing my screen for um, a few minutes and we're gonna go into a, a Q&A uh, section. Give me just a second here. And uh, like I said before, you can go ahead and um, you know, use your Q&A uh, at the bottom of the, the, the screen to go ahead and um, ask your questions. So let's see, uh, someone asked, uh, are these reverse engineered products uh, available on the Paragon website to view? And in most cases, the, the answer to that question is yes, they are. You can find them in, um, in the website under INC products. And I, I'm gonna show an example here in just a minute. We had another question about how to find products at, uh, at, at the Paragon website. So I'll take just a moment and, and show that as well. But you can find most of this, most everything that Paragon has ever done is uh, been cataloged. It's on our website. It's indexed into uh, you know Curtis Wright's Rapid program. So if you use Rapid, uh, you can find our, our solutions there. And uh, if you don't have access to to all those systems for whatever reason, you know we'll print it out and tell you what we can reverse engineer at your station uh, if we've got all of your inventory data. So we can provide that one to one matching. Uh, from you know to part numbers. So let me just show you uh, quickly. Um, I'm going to exit my presentation here and show you guys what it looks like when we search for a part on uh, on the Paragon website. Let me just share my screen here. I would also add that you know a lot of times somebody's reaching out to us to see if we could reverse engineer something. Um, something as simple as just having a picture from it, or if the part number, you know, we can Google search and see a picture of it, we can immediately give you a thumbs up or thumbs down if that's gonna be a, a good candidate for reverse engineering, right? Without even sending any equipment in, so. You know. Right, that's right. So hopefully you guys can see on my screen that I'm at the, the Paragon website, and I'm gonna type in just a, a part number here. So it's a 136 Bravo 1308G007. Someone told me that uh, live demos are always a little dangerous, but we'll see what, what happens here. And you can see when I search in that part number, it brings me right into the Peaks catalog. And in this case, um, I've got the part number over here. I can provide additional search uh, on the manufacturer or the description. But once I get into the, the Peaks um, system, I can go here, I can see all buying options. And um, I can request a quote from this page I can see that you know we have one that's safety related. It's in stock. It's probably in Schenectady, New York. Utilities have a Quanti Seven that are available. So if you needed this in like 24 to 48 hours, you know we can we can call the plants and we'll get that released and provided to you as a safety related solution. Otherwise, you know contact us about repairing the, the system that you already have or uh, you know reverse engineering. And so if I click the re request a quote, it brings me to this very simple menu. I can tell them my name and um, my email address, my phone number, how many I'd like. 
I let them know whether I need that uh, safety related or non safety related. And then I, you know, have a quick message like, you know, maybe uh, I could, I need a response uh, immediately. Please help me out. I'll send that quote request and uh, it'll come right into our, um, into our 24 seven um, customer service folks uh, that are, that do an excellent job of, of providing that help. You can also see here uh, on my screen that, that we have a, a chat function. So if you need to get on the website and you want to chat with somebody, the Peaks catalog supports uh, you know, chatting with our associates and they can help you find something right from this, the um, chat feature as well. Um, so with that, let me uh, see, we've got a couple other questions. Um, do we have a detail of qualification like seismic uh, at our web page? And I think the answer to that is uh, we do talk about qualification. Um, we have the seismic testing qualification um, in our website. You can find that under a qualification dedication section. And it talks about our capabilities in terms of uh, IEEE 344, the response spectra that we can use to qualify parts and you know some of the other stuff. But if you have any detailed questions about qualification, you know, send it over to us and, and we'll evaluate it. And another gentleman asked, how challenging has it been in overcoming cybersecurity requirements at various sites? Uh, Chris, you've got some experience with that. So do you, John. What, what have been some of the challenges and, and what have we had to do to address that? Yeah, so with the, uh, the particular light pack um, uh, product that we were showing, the custom product, um, that, that emergency lighting system, you know, we're still in, still in communication with the customer and we're working with them and, and their cybersecurity department to get those installed. So that's, you know, it's a product that's being developed and, and installed currently. Um, but as far as, you know, when it comes to reverse engineering, if we have something that has a, a uh, programmable device on it, um, you know, we get those requirements all the time and we've, we've, we've provided various products under our own, you know, our own cybersecurity program, as well as in compliance with the customer's requirements. Um, you know, a lot of times when we're doing, like I said, we're doing reverse engineering, we're talking about technology that's either EPROMs or PLDs like John had described or some kind of CPLD, right? It's, it's a discrete chip that has some kind of code or some kind of configuration burned into it. In those cases, if the chip is not locked, then under our, under our um, cybersecurity program, we can, we can develop a plan and, and actions to, to take the code off of that chip and burn it onto another one, all within, all, all maintaining the cybersecurity requirements. Um, and we've done that on several, several products. Um, we've even done it for some items we repaired. The EEPROM has just you know, failed over the years or something's mm -hmm. wrong with it. We've done that. We've had um, situations where a uh, customer sent us a card without the EEPROM in it, um, and we've sent them, our programmer, to, for them to, to take the code off of the EEPROM and then sent us the, the files in a cyber secure way, and we use those files to then uh, burn it onto a new EEPROM. So there's been a lot of different ways um, that we've overcome it. The, the really the only barrier um, when it comes to cyber uh, cybersecurity or replicating and or you know, uh, reverse engineering a, a cyber or digital item is if the code is somehow locked. So if it's a microcontroller that maybe has like flash memory, which is a lot more uh, prevalent in, in modern technologies in the last, you know, five, 10 years, those are typically security, security locked. So those you can't, you can't obtain the information to replicate. That becomes a barrier, and, the, and the, that kind of solution, we would under we would we would treat that particular microcontroller or that processor as a black box, and create new code for that application to run all the stuff around it, if, if it's possible. Yeah, I would uh, clarify that uh, we we provide a lot of cyber secure uh, components, you know, through our our programs as well through dedication, and we have a yep. you know an audited cyber security program at Paragon where we provide. Things you know, even desktop computers that I've seen come through the shop here as uh, as cyber secure devices. So, uh, John Sester, you're going to say something? Uh, yes, I also want to add that um, we can work with the site's cyber security people. Uh, and a good example is that emergency light pack. Um, we are, I should say, Chris designed a, a wrote a program for it, and we presented it to the site's cyber people. 
and they evaluated it and told us, no, you can't do that or you can't do this. So we went back, made modifications, changed some hardware, software, and we customized it such that it was acceptable to the cybersecurity police at the site. So we're able to work with each site uh, because they do have their own specific uh, restrictions. Great, thanks for that, John. Um, so we've got time for some other questions. Anybody have any, anything else they'd like to ask? You can go to that uh, Q&A button. And then if you're on, uh, on YouTube, we've got about a 20 second delay or so once it comes over there, but uh, you're welcome to, to ask a question in that uh, chat as well. So John, I, I mentioned that uh, you know, we've had you know, 24 years of experience doing uh, reverse engineering at Paragon, but you, you've been doing it a little longer than that. How long have you been working on reverse engineering? Uh, since 1985, um, reverse engineered a, a turbine control panel uh, with about 110 different circuit boards. Uh, so that was my, my introduction to reverse engineering and uh, loved it. And since then I've stuck with it and gained uh, a lot of uh, experience, knowledge. Um, I know where to find old parts. Uh, I do keep a good library of data books because I found that it's a better source sometimes of just poking around online trying to find something. So I'll just go back to my library and pull out a book and look for what I need. But you clarify that you're not a hoarder because those are all things that you need. You're not just keeping things you don't need. Okay. That's correct. It's an important <laughs> distinction. Right. <laughs> well, it looks like that's all the Q&A we are going to have today. Uh, so we appreciate it. We really do uh, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Your time is really precious and, and we appreciate it, you spending it with us. And if you guys end up with any other questions or you can't find something on the website or you've got some, some questions about what we can do or some of our other programs, you know, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Uh, all of our contact information uh, is available on the website or you, know, you can use it through even the email that you received as an invitation to this uh, webinar. So we appreciate your time. And with that, we'll, uh, we'll end the webinar and everybody have a, a great and healthy rest of your, uh, your month and year. Bye everybody. Bye. Thanks everybody.